go inside. He went to put the catch pole in the bed of his truck and noticed that it was still littered with feathers. A raven called from one of the trees and he jumped. The bird was just a patch of moving shadow in the dark, but he felt the eyes looking at him. I don't have any food, he said tiredly, in English, since carrion birds had wildly different languages than songbirds. The raven caught again and landed heavily on the hood of his truck, head cocked. He held out his hand and the raven rubbed its beak against his gloved fingers, pecking for food and finding nothing. I said I didn't have anything. He called the raven Poe, as it was the obvious thing to call it, and he didn't see himself as a very creative man. He gave it old breakfast cereal when he first moved in, and the mealtime soon became habit, prompting the bird to stick around. His coworkers most likely wouldn't approve of the unprofessional nature of it, but Johnson didn't mind. He enjoyed the bird's company, even though, or perhaps because, neither of them had anything to say. Later, Johnson sat at his desk and practiced writing with his left hand like he'd done for many months now, first printing his name, then signing it, then moving on to the simple words, the, yes, no. The words resembled the handwriting of a child that had only recently been made aware of the existence of a written word, and he crumpled up the notebook paper he was practicing on, only to flatten it out and start again. After what seemed to be hours of writing exercises, Johnson put on his gloves, wrinkled from being kept in his pockets, and filled out the empty fingers on his right hand with bits of crumpled paper. He placed it on the desk under the lamplight and looked at it. It gave the illusion of fully functioning normalcy. And after sitting and staring at it for quite some time, he could believe that it was real. That instead of marred skin and nerve damage, his hand had simply fallen asleep. Thank you. Up to the microphone from South Carolina, her regal majesty, Madison, not Mason, Madison Seabrook. The summer before my freshman year of high school, years of teasing and failed bra shopping created an allegorical weight on my chest. I started to research breast reductions. The timing was appropriate. June and July are the months of cancer. When I visited the doctors about my reduction three years ago, they became alarmed and my cancer screenings began. They rejected the idea that their size was due to growths, but they thought they felt small masses like soft tulip bulbs buried in warm spring soil. I thought of the color green of the stem of a tulip and tried to pretend like the chair on which I lay was the very stem and I was the peach petals on top of it. Topless in front of my doctor and two of her observers as they took notes, I raised my arms up to my sides, at my sides. The flower bends in the room where she sheds her tunic to show the flower bud, though no breeze or age carries her to do so. The tests were inconclusive. A waiting room is a waiting room is a waiting room is a place for waiting and no one likes waiting. For a place where people spend so much time, the seats had a sheen of just being taken out of plastic wrap. The floors bore a reflection of my face, and it was as if I was in the middle of some ocular lens, witnessing the image of myself shifting into a less sentient being, one who was accustomed to exposing all blooming parts of herself. Could you please? I raised my arms above my head. Did the nurse deem my nonverbal reaction as sassy? Did I care? I had other things on my mind, such as imagining myself three months in the future. Would I be in a similar room, the tulip surrounded by vases of dyed daisies? No, it was not likely. I tried to imagine a gaggle of friends in this blinking room. As much as I would not want to be there, they would want to even less. Even though I've always been quiet, my mother and doctors were the only ones to see Tulip me. The cinegrapher cleared her throat. There may not be anything here. The image on the screen twitched like a hurricane caught in television static. I have not been overproducing pollen. Thank you. (laughs) 
Up next is an expert from Dennis and Kim Forever, written by playwright Moss Perricone and actors Kelly Perdison and Brandon Okazo. Okazo, sorry, it's Okazo. It's all right. Scene one, a living room in North Korea's Sun Palace, a display of mindless color and excess, the Ed Hardy equivalent of a room. Dennis Rodman sits on one of the overstuffed couches looking bored. He's essentially a giant toddler with giant, giant toys, wearing patterns that can induce epilepsy. There is a bottle of his Dennis Rodman bad boy vodka on the table next to a basketball signed by Michael Jordan. The door opens and Kim Jong-un enters. He's 28 years old, but he still has baby fat. His suit is too big for him. Yo, Kim. Dennis Rodman. It is a pleasure to meet you. Dennis stands. They shake hands. I didn't come here for no pleasure. If I want pleasure, I go to the Copacabana Gentlemen's Club in Long Beach. I go to SeaWorld. But I sure as hell don't go to no North Korea. Dennis Rodman in my palace. I'm excited like a little girl. That's some strange shit to say. Drink with me. Kim takes a shot of the vodka. This is very good. I know, I made it. Dennis, this basketball is my most special possession. Nobody touches it but me, and I want you to sign it. This is a very great honor for you. Kim, are you feeling me right now? I said this isn't no booze cruise. I come here on official diplomat business. Please address me as Marshall. Address you as Marshall? What, like Marshall Mathers? Eminem? You think I'm gonna go, you think I'm gonna go easy on you because you like rap music? They tell me you got people starving and Obama's not doing nothing about it. Well, Dennis Rodman's the Obama of the streets, and you, bet your, and you bet your ass he's gonna do something about it. Kim takes another shot. I did not bring you here to talk about politics. The only person that brought Dennis Rodman here is Dennis Rodman. <laughs> you think Dennis Rodman is some signature robot? You think all Dennis Rodman can do is put his name on shit? Dennis Rodman is a diplomat, and Dennis Rodman wants answers for these hungry motherfuckers. <laughs> you are misinformed. North Korea is the most productive nation on the planet. My grandfather, our dear leader, rescued this country from poverty and starvation. A beat. this is not what Dennis expected. Well, I don't even know what to say about that. But I hear you talking a lot of shit about America. I hear you want to destroy America. Huh. Tell me this, you're a basketball fan, right? I have 258 Dennis Rodman jerseys. So tell me this, why you want to destroy America? That is where basketball comes from. America is the mother of basketball. Why do you want to kill basketball's mother? Basketball is the greatest North Korean pastime. Then why? You want to orphan it. Answer the question. You want to orphan basketball? America needs to learn to respect me. But this ball is incomplete without your signature. Who's going to respect you if you destroy America? Fucking Mexico? Hawaii? <laughs> then... Then I hear you got some American journalists locked up in a camp. Dennis Rodman did his research. These ain't no fucking outdoor science camps. Do you believe everything the American media tells you? Yes. Except for Anderson Cooper. Anderson Cooper's an asshole. He says, Dennis Rodman, don't go to North Korea. Don't visit Kim. And you know what I say? <laughs> I say, you ain't my father. You ain't my motherfucking father. Dennis Rodman does whatever Dennis Rodman wants to do. He think Dennis Rodman can't practice no diplomacy. He think Hillary Clinton, the only one that can be a hero. Well, guess what? Guess what, Anderson? Dennis Rodman got a whole lot of, clear, got a whole lot of Hillary Clinton inside of him. Dennis Rodman can be a hero. Dennis takes a shot and then another. <sighs> Goddamn. <laughs> All that diplomacy shit got me sweaty. Thank you. <laughs> and so, a poet who's on a break from being the dictator of North Korea, now to share her poetry is Kaylee Peterson. Excerpt from the Peridolia, 1870, Savannah, Georgia, 
four. We buried the children next to my brother. My husband cast his gaze away from my deathbed delivery room. Another year passed, another child born in uncanny stillness, while my brother-in-law Henry conducted his architectural symphony in the Rose Garden. I rested my head on his shoulder, and he trembled faintly in the light of midday. His hand came up and traced my pulse gently, like he was waiting for me to run. At lunch, we took tea together in the garden. As the cicadas cried out in this flush of southern heat, this burst of fire that scarred the land while Henry and I ate on porcelain plates and watched Savannah burn. My husband commented that he had a genius for a brother and a saint for a wife. Henry put his hand on my knee under the table, and I smiled like the Madonna. Henry's labyrinth festered and grew, a terrifying apparatus in serpentine complexity. And the hedges sprung about us come morning, growing tangled together like the span of our lives, twisted and bent. Five. My husband did not turn back when he left, looking for sons and a woman who could give them to him. I went back inside the house, and Henry and I sat drinking lemonade until the afternoon withered in our hands. Six. Leviticus 20:21. 20, and if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. Seven. We waited a full season before starting anew in the spring. Henry built in a house with the organs cut out. He cleaved skin from masonry bone. The labyrinth descended like a wound into the earth, great and terrible in skeletal requiem. I looked out over his mausoleum and knew then the ruination of myth the defiling of architecture into blasphemy. And when Henry emerged flushed with genius and kissed me on the side of the mouth, I saw the labyrinth grow to consume his terrifying imagination, casting a shadow over the bedroom where we lay like two pieces of broken history, the sheet stained red with the blood of changeling children delivered unto this world and meant for another. Our son was born with twisted hands and cloven feet, a little man made in the devil's image. He opened his bright, wet eyes, and Henry looked at him and said nothing for a very long time. He was born dead, Henry said, and took him from my arms. The baby squealed. How unfortunate, I replied. Thank you. <laughs> The soon-to-be-published novelist wanted me, the voice of goddess, to make sure that all of you knew that her novel will be soon available this spring on Amazon.com. Thank you very much. Go ahead, go ahead and plug your way. Bringing us the truth is Alexandra Bissett. In the summer, Mikey and me see Mr. Henderson's son Jeb riding a brown horse in front of their field. I still don't know how Jeb gets up on that horse's back, and I don't know how the poor thing doesn't snap right in half once he does. Jeb has short, stubby legs like sausage links from the bell, and he's round as a honey-glazed ham. But when I said this to Mikey, he told me to hush my dang mouth because Melvin was walking close by and might hear. Melvin was wearing suspenders and bare naked feet, tossing an apple in his left hand like he wanted to see if it would come back down. Hey, Melvin, I shouted over to him before Mikey could get his hand over my mouth. Ruthie, by God, Mikey started to say, but I shushed him. He rolled his green eyes. Morning, little miss, Melvin said, catching his apple and motioning with his free hand as if to tip a cap. I strolled over to where he stood on the other side of the fence. Standing so close to him, Melvin was even taller than usual. Even standing on the bottom plank of the fence, I had to tilt my head all the way up like I was looking for the top of heaven just to see his sun-baked face. He smiled down at me, and I saw that his deep purple bottom lip was split like the, the flesh of a ripe plum. What you done to your lip, Melvin? I asked. Did you get kicked or something? Oh no, Miss Carey. Melvin ain't never been kicked by no horse. They's too gentle, see? But then how, I began, but before I could even finish my question, Jeb Henderson came thundering past on his brown horse like a man on fire, smacking Melvin on the back of the head with a fist as he went. Lord Jesus, shouted Mikey from a few feet behind me. 
Melvin staggered, shaking his head back and forth like a confused basset hound, then straightened up and smiled like a drunkard. I just stood there, watching Jeb streaking away toward the pond, laughing madly. Hey, Melvin, you all right? Asked Mikey, who had walked over to stand next to me on the grass. He was still taller than me. Right as rain, Mr. Michael. Young Jeb just liked to mess is all. Well, dang, Melvin. That looks plain mean from back where I was. Nah, it ain't nothing. You two know all about messing, don't ya? We stood silent. Well, I best be returning to my work. Good day to you both, he said, tipping his imaginary hat again. I whistled once Melvin was well away. That was downright evil. Thank you. <laughs> Next to blaze the mic is Moroccan-born, Queens, New York-flavored poet, Yasmin Belker. Sink. My aunt miscarried four times, and after each one, she took me to Chinatown in the city, and we would watch the gloved men gut fish after fish after fish as if it meant something. She carried all the ultrasounds for years after with names and the expected dates of birth scribbled on the back and on the train ride home, she'd clutch the bag of headless fish close to her body and softly rub her finger over the worn leather of her wallet where the faint memories of life gathered dust inside. My uncle used to burn hundreds of matches on our front porch, each lighting like a firefly. The first time we came home, he stared at my aunt's stomach and stumbled backwards, something immense, something too big to describe, to understand, quaking inside of him. He stopped burning matches and started burning flowers instead. My aunt carries him too in the way she walks, stooped over with this gentle sadness that pulls her into the floor like sand. Selma, May 17, 2003. Layla, November 26, 2006. Sophia, January 4, 2007. Hannah, August 23, 2011. Four seasons for four daughters. Every day, dawn is the time for grief. Dawn is the moment when my aunt can finally sob under the weight of the world. Uh, a 34-year-old Atlas with a home empty of children and a body that deemed her unfit. I have grown into a family of grief, a life in which mourning and mourning mean the same thing. She said once, I am a shell, and you can hear the ocean sputter and cough in my bones. I swear I would swim if I wasn't already sinking. Thank you. She loves the night but hates driving, an avid laugher and coffee drinker that cannot be captured in just a few words. Here is Isabel Debris with her short story, Night driving. Hi, I'll be reading an excerpt from my short story, Night Driving. I look at Helen in the front seat and remember the way we spoke about our loves, our complexes. Sitting on her porch in South Illinois, we used to drink Canada dry and pretend to live in Canada. <laughs> I think of the colors we didn't know hid in the sky, all that red. The way she laughed with her hair thrown back, the brown strands sticking to her lips. I remember the smoking, the standing up in the backs of pickup trucks shrieking, the parties with someone else's friends. I miss mostly the things that used to be forbidden, how as teenagers we would hide our knob creek and cigarettes under my aunt's porch. The cigarettes would sag from the dew and we would sneak back to our separate homes with shoes soaked, smelling recklessly of cheap tobacco. Not much has changed in 20 years, except for our lives and our bodies. Now we're driving in her Lexus, big enough to fit the kids she doesn't have. Her GPS tells her to turn right. 
All of a sudden, she's 40 and likes to know where she's going. You knew me better than anyone, I say. Her lips purse at the past tense. As we drive down Mulhall and Drive, I can't help but feel how it's inevitable. Her auto insurance, her husband the Hollywood producer, the pair of yellow lines separating her path from the opposite. How's Tom? I watch her mouth laugh. How's Tom, she repeats. You should ask him. You're pretty. She looks fragile, crawling gingerly into the turns. On the Illinois road, she used to sweep through night and day as if they were the same. Look, she says, pointing off the cliff's edge. Bet you don't have that in Vermont. City lights blur across the dark valley. She rolls down her window. Tom hovers unanswered, but when the traffic light changes, she says, he was a cold man, too many veins in his neck. She closes her eyes, a momentary shutting out. Remember when my wedding boat was caught in a whirlpool? The party boat swirled in the water. The bridesmaids screamed and the spray soaked her dress. I knew it was a sign, she says, the lines in her chin quivering like they did at graduation. I noticed her wedding ring on her index finger. I just knew it. The light falls, fading to gray and then lavender. It's quiet and I want to talk, but she doesn't ask if my Vermont cabin gets lonely or about the sales of my pastoral poetry. The Cabernet and bread from our Italian dinner sit heavily in the pit of my stomach as though I'd swallowed something that was making itself permanent. Thank you. Give it up for Isabel Debray. Isabel Debray. Now let's get ready to experience a sophomore sort of have a meltdown, sort of, from Palo Alto, California, Lily Dodd. I'm going to be reading um, an excerpt from my short story, A Sort of Meltdown. Upstairs in his wood smoke smelling room, Oliver slept for 10 hours. When he woke up, he ordered a glass of champagne from room service, but by the time Stephen from Utah knocked on his door, Oliver felt too sad to pretend to be over 21 and told Stephen from Utah he could have the champagne for himself. To which Stephen from Utah replied, why are you crying? Oliver didn't answer. Even in his kilt, Stephen from Utah was obviously cooler than Oliver. Wind and weather had drawn strong, premature lines on his face that might have been ugly, but looked instead like finishing touches. Stephen from Utah probably hiked with a beat-up copy of Proust in his backpack and could fight off a bear by talking to it. Oliver couldn't handle, it right, handle him right now, and he sobbed harder and harder and it t until it felt like the sounds coming out of him were at once both animalian and horrifically human. You seem sad, said Stephen from Utah, perching himself on the edge of Oliver's bed. What's wrong? Please go away, Oliver hiccuped. Nothing's wrong. Overruled, said Stephen from Utah. He handed Oliver the champagne. Getting drunk will make you feel better. As Churchill once said, I have taken more out of alcohol than alcohol has taken out of me. <laughs> Oliver took a swig of the champagne, brain momentarily short-circuiting in the fizz. He wiped his mouth with the back of his hand and looked Stephen from Utah dead in the eye and said, I am so sick of you people, you pretentious, handsome, motherfucking assholes. And Stephen from Utah, delighted, threw back his head and laughed. Stephen from Utah had a snowmobile and said the pizza place was not that far. It was not until the hotel had disappeared around a corner of white trees that Oliver realized that there was at least a 30% chance that Stephen from Utah was a kilt-wearing serial killer slash rapist who targeted emotionally disturbed young men and would leave Oliver's mutilated body in the snow with a Bible verse written in blood on his bare chest. <laughs> Oliver considered jumping off, but that would mean certain death. Well, if he landed incorrectly, which he would. And then he remembered that Stephen from Utah was from Utah, which meant he was most likely some sort of champagne-drinking Mormon and probably would not kill Oliver, as that would be against Mormon principles. <laughs> Just as Oliver had completed his calculations and decided that there was an 80% chance that Stephen from Utah was a Mormon, a 13% chance that he was a serial killer, a 5% chance that he was a serial rapist, and a 2% chance that he was just a guy who was tired of taking off his kilt to eat pizza with nobody, Stephen from Utah pointed to a red roof in the not-too-distant distance and said, there it is. Thank you. <laughs> Aesthetics. 
a poetic critical reflection on art, culture, and nature. Up to the stage is Alicia Lai. I will be reading two poems tonight, the first entitled Muscle. When I first opened my mouth, I had a pink double spit tongue somersaulting in the slow way otters do when trying to snap the backbones of sea urchins. Eventually, my fingernails grew long rings of white bone curling over my head. Eventually, they netted me, cracking the calcium shell in my stomach over and over like vertebrae. Their chefs tried to corkscrew me open. Then I could only think what joy it would bring, the sputter where the butter on the pan went soft and limp. I lick my lips, watching the day slip down the sink, water still running. The oven flickers like pulling spoons from my insides. There is no running water in the kitchen, sometimes too much water. Creation doesn't begin with rebirth, not even for the crayfish, not even for me. Sometimes there's a trash can that tips over on the cutting board of the night. Sometimes an onion under the knife that sings and sings before gagging my mouth a feast. Regarding the sunrise over Lancaster Orchards, May 1999, mother did not want a generation of fresh sunspots replacing the freckles that she scrubbed off the bridge of her nose. When her womb swelled, she refused to open the shutter-sealed blinds, moved her potted garden inside the windowsill. Not the noise, not the fluttering inside her, not the scratch of branches on the window. October 1999, when my sister was born, I was afraid to hold her. She was preserved on the lip of an eggshell, fists like skipping stones, cracking the almond slivers of her fingernails. Too light, bones hollow, in the treetops a nuthatch lays her eggs in a string of pearls, the basket a makeshift nest. October 2004, my sister climbs to the top of the family tree, throws down enough fruit to feed the family. If it is barren, she unrolls the apple knife from the hem of her shirt, uses the buds as a substitute. The next spring, mother takes an ax to the tree by the barn, felling its flowers like mouthfuls of apple, unripe. November 2004, mother only keeps to the house now. November 2005, but as daughters we are brazen, spilling in like locusts to the countryside, carving our initials on the door frames, pressing our palms against the Pennsylvania panes. We inherited the sun's affliction through the hair, one with the wheaten braid, the other with curls like the rinds of summer squash. September 2005, the nut hatches still hover like the freckles we tried so hard to scrub away, drawing blood on our shoulders before they fly south for the winter. Mother says, leave it be. On the first day of school, my sister says nut hatches build nests in the alcoves of her heart, watching the embryo somersault through the phases of birth. This year, there are no nests. Let them be, she says, tossing apple cores over her shoulder, no open beaks there to catch them. Thank you. An inspiring ice cream taster, the talented sophomore Lucy Salbau. I'm gonna read an excerpt from my short story, Patch. They're sitting down to eat when the first big thunderclap shakes the house followed by the familiar sound of raindrops clanging like pennies as they land on the aluminum patch in the roof. The patch is a silver rectangle, eight by 12 feet. It slants with the roof, one half over the living room and the other over Max's bedroom upstairs. Water dribbles in when it rains too hard. For Julia, the patch is as much a part of her house as anything else, the peeling vinyl siding, the azalea bushes, the square fans in the third floor windows to substitute for air conditioning. Julia's dad nailed the patch down nine years ago after their mother died. There had been a leak in the roof when they bought the house. Her dad told Julia once that her mother always asked him to fix it, but he never had time. After the funeral, it was the first thing he did, even before scribbling thank you notes to the neighbors who brought flowers and casserole. Julia was five at the time, but she can still remember the sharp bangs as the hammer drove the nails in. 
Thinking about her mother is like trying to coordinate her left and right hands in a piece of music when she has all the notes individually, but they just won't fit together. Julia's dad tells her things about her mother all the time. She was great at volleyball. She loved Dar Williams and had her cartilage pierced. Her favorite food was pepperoni. But Julia knows that having someone tell you about a person is infinitely different from knowing the person. It would take thousands of questions, thousands of details, just to get a true sense. What made her laugh? What did she smell like? Was she a good driver? Max has a fantastic memory, and sometimes if Julia really pries, he will tell her more. That she sneezed loudly and was a good singer. That she used to let them draw on the bathroom mirror with her lipstick. Julia has only a few blurry memories of her own, turning pages as a woman's voice read a story, tugging her thick baby fingers through someone's hair, dark and tangled, just like her own. Mostly, though, it is vague and just slightly out of reach, like trying to remember how snow feels. Thanks. Reading from her personal essay, please welcome Catherine Zhu. Excerpt from Xavier. In August, after one week of driving, my dad and I reached the Pacific Ocean. We sat there on the rocks when the sky was still red, staring as the first few broken rays of sunlight caught the incoming tide. Make a wish, he said. You know what they say. Whatever we lose, it's always ourselves we find in the sea. I looked all the way out to the horizon, and I tried to feel free, but all I could think about was how my father and I had stood, sorry, stood in Sandy Hook Bay one summer day when I was eight, me on his shoulders. How I'd begged him to climb down and swim out to sea to find the clownfish in Finding Nemo. How he'd laughed, shaking his head. I knew that I would never feel that way again. I was not alive no matter how much I longed to be. That summer, I biked out to the other side of town to interview for a babysitting job. I could barely take care of myself, but I needed the money. I waited out there with my head bowed, listening to the trash make small grating sounds against the sidewalk and half wishing that the door wouldn't open. A young Hispanic woman who looked barely four years older than me came to the door. She had large eyes that were deep set and bloodshot and mascara stained her cheeks. You must be Catherine. She led me to the kitchen, her footsteps echoing across the linoleum floor. The inside of the house was oddly bare, empty of colorful toys and picture frames. The only thing in the living room was an old television set. Does he have any siblings, I asked. His older brother died last month, she said. Just then, Xavier came running up to his mother, grabbing her arm. He looked up at me, motionless, with large eyes, the eyes of his mother. When I met his gaze, he looked down to the floor, embarrassed. How old are you, I asked, trying to manage a smile. He didn't answer me. That first day, I made hamburgers while Xavier slept on the couch. He was small for his six years, and the sound of his, foot, his laughter was like a tin cup rattling in the rain. I stood, by the, I stood by the stove, concentrating on the sizzle of hot grease, on the hazy hum of voices playing on the television next to me, on the rain streaking the window pane, trying to avoid the thoughts about death that came so often when I was alone. But all I had to do was close my eyes, and the vision of another world would pass over me. Thank you. Up next is the token liberal from her hometown of Fort Worth, Texas. Please give it up for Faith Patchett. <laughs> Hi. I'm going to be reading two poems, the first of which is called Kind of Pretty. She stumbled across the dress, smelling of peaches and diesel. It had covered the white ceramic in a discarded heap, 
like it had been spilled while it was still warm, firming up where it had lain. Stricken and slightly numb, she had stared. How crumpled the fabric was, folding back on itself like skin, revealing a ruddy slip underneath. It might have been a kind of pretty, in a better light might have glistened like the sunset scales of the koi fish, which traced lazily in its pond on the label of the perfume bottle, standing upright on the vanity she knew, and not this foreign sink she leaned against. Or a closer kind of pretty, a deep blush, blood rush red, and sticky with sweat, the smell masked in sickly sweetness, the cut of the dress sliding across the thigh, him frayed from being pulled. She saw the sheath of an old thrill left out for her to take again, and she did. Now she runs, breath heavy, and in it all, she is kind of pretty. The second is called As I Saw Her. In old photographs, her hair is long, but I don't remember it like that. No, when I knew her, it sprouted like seedlings when she felt good and shrank like dying daffodils in winter's bitter grasp when she didn't. She seemed to feel more alive in the warmer months when the sun's brilliance heated and illuminated her fragile skin caused her canas to bloom and coaxed those locks from her head. Then things would turn, the chill in the wind cutting across her face as her follicle shrank and fell like the gentle rain coming down outside. I remember just before the end when her once beautiful body refused to lend itself to life the bile in her ballooning belly growing greater by the day, the gray pallor that replaced her tawny skin, which had soaked in the sun, and the bouquets piled up around her room, their ends cut away, drinking in their water, that her hair, in a resilient push, grew just a bit, so that when she died, she might be graced with something simply human, and our eyes might see her as she was in old photographs. Thank you. Expressing her sickness, Megan Walters. I'm reading an excerpt from my short story called Lovesick, an Adjective and Other Assorted Definitions. Prevarication, noun. My brother Kaylin says that Turby is a stupid name for a hedgehog, that it sounds too much like Tubby and everyone will make fat jokes and he'll get depressed and I'll find him at the top of his cage one morning, hanging from a noose of piss-stained straw. <laughs> I shouldn't believe him. Kaylin's the best liar I've ever met and he uses the ability often. Just last week, a bush in our front yard flattened itself, the same night a bottle of dad's vodka went missing from his liquor cubby inside our piano. Kaylin swore it was some drunken man in a truck, which now that I think about it is half true. He just forgot to mention that the man was him and the truck was our 1998 Volvo. I named my hedgehog Turby. Now, Kaylin's tapping the tip of his pencil on the desk like he always does when he's annoyed. And this erratic pattern like chick, chick, pause, chick, pause, chick, 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 leaving a blob of black dots on the wood, how I used to draw fireworks. Jesus, Garrett. Kaylin drops his pencil with a final chick thump roll. Can't you stop clicking your tongue for one fucking minute and go play outside like a normal kid? I shrugged. I don't know. I don't think so. I think I just am this way. Dr. Wilkins says the tongue clicking is my way of dealing with things, except I'm not sure what things he's talking about or how tongue motion is supposed to deal with the things, but hey, dad calls him the professional. I hardly ever notice I'm doing it anymore until Kaylin whines about it. It was a rhetorical question, dumbass. Kaylin slaps his hand down on the desk. What I really meant is pipe the fuck down before I make you, you little fucktard. <laughs> I never understood Kaylin's vocabulary. One second, he's using all these words I need a dictionary to look up, like rhetorical, and the next he's all, shitty shit fuck, goddammit, motherfucking asshole. 
I talked about it once in one of my sessions with Doc, and he said it's a defense mechanism, that Kalen needs a profanity as a barrier between himself and the rest of the world to prove he's tougher. I guess it makes sense, but sometimes I think it just might feel good, those words wrapped around his tongue, dribbling off his lips, milky maybe, white or smooth or cold. God damn it, Garrett! And he gets up, slams the bedroom door shut behind him. Guess I clicked my tongue again. I click it a few more times, just because I can now, and I wonder if clicking is my profanity, if it feels the same way to me as, God damn it, Garrett, does to Kaylin. White or smooth or cold, maybe bubbles at the top when you shake it a little. A foamy layer to all that pale depth, maybe. Thank you. <laughs> Up next should be the chosen one, the boy who lived, Joshua Kimmelman. Hi there. I'll be reading an excerpt or two excerpts from my novel, Aluf David. Aluf David Street was noise. It was shapes, too. The whole street was a horseshoe. It hugged the neighborhood, and on the side where my house was were the shacks that were in its way and the schoolhouse, and at either end it was stopped dead by Oded. The houses on the side of Oded closest to Aluf David were in Ramat Khen, still in the neighborhood. On the other side, the houses were in Tel Aviv. The border was the middle of the road. It split Oded in two. But mostly it was noise. Geography and topography lived in sound, in putting your ear to the pavement. Much of the noise was silence and the seashell sound of cars and of everything that rides the wind. But it was also sounds as distinct and recognizable as faces, houses, the curves of the street. It was a map hung in the air. It was memory, dirty and dripping and damp and brackish, like laundry on the line. The street's history was gunfire, one shot in the confusion of night that killed Israel's first general, David, an American. It was independence the night before the ceasefire, and he left the barracks at Abu Ghosh, wrapped in his bed sheets, like a child pretending to be a ghost, and walked the perimeter, killed by friendly fire, already wearing a funeral shroud. Later, they laid a wreath on his grave and scratched his name on a street sign. The whole street was the siren, that drone that scared me so much my father dug a trench in the backyard and the whole family would lie there in the dirt while it went just to make me feel safe. It was the silence that accompanied the siren and the howling of dogs, the noisy silence of a family brought down to its knees in the dirt, of a neighborhood made dumb by fear. The silence was what scared me and the siren, the silence of the siren of, and of the howling of dogs, these sounds the whole neighborhood shared. Silence that never stopped sounding, rockets that never fell but seemed always on the cusp, a silence that ricocheted like bullets between the two sides of Aluf David Street that executed us, laid us down to rest in dirt we dug ourselves in houses, cellars, basements. There were never any rockets, though I could swear I heard them. Instead, there was only the noise of the siren, the silence, and the fear, anticipation. There was only Aluf David Street wrapping its arms around us, solemn. There was only noise, only noise, only silence, deafening. It pummeled us. It was the ground beneath our feet, the street, the siren. It lingered, lingers. There was only noise and the, and the shadow, the ghost of other things, like General David wrapped in bed sheets. And there was only me. There was only me, lying in dirt, waiting for rockets to fall. And there was only me, sitting on a windowsill, letting my feet hang off the side, listening to the street sigh. Thank you. Finalmente, una poeta enamorada con España, 
a poet in love with Spain, Antonia Silva. Moon dance in a Barcelona thunderstorm. We are going to kiss like two crocodiles floating down the Nile River, sun drunk on pomegranates, figs, and dates. You will hand me un fresón, the largest strawberry of Southern California. When I say speak to me in Spanish because you are studying Spanish literature and language at the university and I'm in love with the Spanish painters, you will say, quisiera que tus piernas fueran de turquesa because then Dali would paint me surrounded by watermelon trees with ruby lips and space elephants with purple glitter bicycle helmets. In Mexico City, I will braid my hair like Frida Kahlo. We've painted flowers through my tresses. And before we fall asleep, you will remove the flowers, plant them in la macetas that line the sea foam walls of our hotel room. You are going to buy me a Chet Baker record, and we will sit on a bench in the plaza of Girona listening to my funny Valentine while families eat Spanish meals in outdoor cafes. Roasted carrot ginger soup, halibut cooked in pineapple juice with tomatoes, violet ice cream. Together, we will dance in the plaza, eyes fixed on each other like Los Trasojados in Goya's paintings. We will stand on a beach in Cuba watching seaweed drown in the Atlantic, and you will tell me that in Spanish, the verb to drown is ahogarse. Ibrahim Ferrer will croon in the background, husky dos gardenias, and I might fall more in love with the scent of clementines that lingers on your shirt. We are going to kiss like Latin jazz in Spanish Harlem. Thank you. Like Latin jazz in Spanish Harlem. These writers just make me want to dance with myself. Please give it up for the 2014 Young Arts Writers. 